Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, hello, I'm Rebecca Dosh Brown, and I'm one of the co facilitators today for the second of five uh, disability justice workshops for the Minnesota state community, um, which will, we will run monthly through um, early May. We're recording this session and every session, and they'll eventually be edited and posted to the Minnesota State 2030 Equity website with accessible handouts of the slides and resources that we mentioned today. Thanks for joining us. Um, first, we'll do a quick recap um, to ensure accessibility. As this session is not the intro session, we'll do this step a little more quickly. We have ASL interpretation and live captioning available. To access ASL interpretation, we've spotlighted the video of Amber, the ASL interpreter. Um, Tony will provide live captioning. Just click the two CCs on your toolbar and click enable. Today's session is racial justice and disability justice, working together to free our minds and bodies. The photo on the slide shows people of different races, ages, and disabilities posing for a photo. They hold a banner that says interdependence is survival. And today we will be sharing some tough, possibly triggering issues that occur at the intersection of racism and ableism. Um, so we are asking you to pay special attention to the systems that create these barriers and the real harm for some people more than others who live at the intersection. But first, let's pause to center our learning by offering a land acknowledgement and a commitment to action statement. Second here. All right, so um, Minnesota State acknowledges the land and the tribal nations upon whose land this work is being accomplished. We acknowledge that we are on Dakota land. We recognize the native nations of this region who have called this place home over thousands of years, including the Anishinaabe, Lakota, Nakota, Ho-Chunk, and Cheyenne. We acknowledge the ongoing colonialism and the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that foreground the formation of Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. We commit to advancing critical efforts to understand and address these legacies, including the larger conversation of reparations, repatriation, and redress urgently needed for the scope of ethical acknowledgement to begin in earnest. We affirm our commitment to address systemic racism, ableism, and all other inequalities and forms of oppression to ensure inclusive communities. On this slide um, are your four co-facilitators for all five of the sessions. Uh, Katrina Simons is not with us today. Um, She'll, she'll be there for the March and April sessions. Again, I'm Rebecca Dosh Brown. My pronouns are she, hers, or they, theirs. What makes me unique is I can speak Japanese and I'd like my co-facilitators to also say what makes them unique. Muna? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I... I don't know what makes me unique, but I, I speak multiple different languages and um, Amharic was the first um, language I went to school for and learned how to write. Um, and that's Amharic is Ethiopian language. And I will pass it to Jenna. Thanks, Muna. I'm Jenna Ferguson. And what makes me unique? Um, I don't know if it's a unique, but uh, I am, most people either knit or crochet, and I am one who really enjoys doing both. That's awesome. Thank you, Jana and Muna. Um, so again, Katrina isn't here today, but she will be with us soon. All right. So um, now it's your turn. Um, we want to welcome 
welcome everyone today as you come. Uh, in chat, please put your name, your campus affiliation, and one thing that makes you unique. Um, and also we ask that you listen to your body and take breaks and move as needed. Okay, sorry, I'm using a paper script, so it takes a little navigation for my brain. All right, so our learning objectives are for today. They are, um, we want the learner to know the systems that deliver the greatest injustices at the intersection of multiple minoritized identities um, focused on ableism and racism. And two, name and spot common detours away from justice work. And three, we're going to learn others' ideas on racial and disability justice. And four, lastly, we will chart, we will ask you to chart your own growth as an advocate and ally. Um, this slide shows a photo of Kimberly Crenshaw smiling. Crenshaw is a lawyer, a civil rights advocate and feminist. She identifies as a black woman. Crenshaw is known as the person who first coined the, the, um, the phrase intersectionality. And I just realized my control panel is, has a little, there we go. It had a little problem with the box. Sorry about that. So intersectionality is a lens, a premise, a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. So some people think it's just like times two, but it's actually a compounding of oppression when you have multiple marginalized or minoritized identities. Um, at the same time, um, we should not forget, as we had shared last month, that such intersectional oppression always occurs at the same time that the people without marginalized or minoritized identities, they receive excessive privileges from the very same systems that are causing this exasper exacerbation. Um, so the systems are built in this way that favor some groups a lot and exclude and harm other groups more or um, exclusively. So I think you need to think about both the aspect of privilege that comes with oppression and the harm. That's the main point. And here we have a video. Um, this is from the activist Carrie Gray. She will talk about how she sees intersectionality as a black disabled woman. She is a, a smaller build person, um, identifies as African American, and she is wearing a black head wrap and a red, bright red shirt and hoop earrings and glasses. So let me try to play that for you. My name is Carrie Gray. Carrie Gray is a black disabled woman and there's power behind that. In the United States, one in four in the black community have some type of disability, whether that's visible or invisible. Historically speaking, organizations and institutions have shown us that they wanna identify with one thing and build power around that, build influence and access. And I get it, right? So um, this idea that you have disability rights, you have women's rights, you have LGBTQ rights, and those kind of different pockets are really building a strong narrative. But the thing that I find to be harmful is when we're not building in coalition. Because the reality is, is that you have people like myself who are black, disabled, and women, and so many other things. And when you live at the intersections of all three of those, then you can't split your political and social dynamics between these different groups. It doesn't produce real results of freedom, and it doesn't produce real results of access to employment and other opportunities that you're looking for. I'll give one example on this. So the Black Lives Matter movement. 
When it was created, it was created in conjunction mostly with a lot of young folks. What was unique about this particular movement was the intersectional philosophy that was built upon. The folks getting up and saying, we are not just fighting for one narrative, but we are specifically fighting for folks who are on the margins. We are fighting for black folks who are also LGBTQ, who are women, who are femme, who are trans, who are disabled. They named it. They saw like their people across the country and said, I'm fighting for all of you not just some of you, not just the ones that have traditionally gained power and access. And that gives me a lot of hope um, because no one wants to be left behind. Okay, so Carrie is suggesting that freedom can only be reached if we are working in coalition across our identities. Um, and I agree with her. She also argues that we should not have to silence or suppress part of who we are in our justice work. So the questions we have for you today are, how can we bring our whole selves into social justice spaces? And how do we ensure no one is left behind? These are two good questions we need to keep asking as we work together. I would argue that we, again, need to look at the intersectional lens and the privilege detector at the same time to understand how any oppressive system works. So the two questions I want you to ask today are who is included and favored according to their race and disability in these systems? and who is excluded, erased, or harmed according to their race and disability status in these systems? Those are two very important questions we need to ask. My name is Carrie. Um, next, we have just a snippet of an awesome uh, new podcast from Ibram X. Kendi. Um, and now that we have that sense of the intersectionality, I would thought we should listen to at least the four minute introduction um, to Ibram X. Kendi's first episode of his new podcast called Be Anti-Racist. I was so thankful he produced his very first episode because it captures exactly how we need to think about racism and ableism. As a historian, Kendi knows how intertwined racism and ableism is, and he also personalizes that for us with a story of his family. So let's give it a listen. And again, it's about four minutes long. Oh, sorry, I did not mean to do that. Let me go back, people. Here we go. Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. Can you see this screen, everybody? Just want to make sure. I can't see you, so you got to unmute and tell me. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. A few years ago, I got a terrifying phone call. The police were at my parents' house. They'd been called by my brother, who was living with our parents at the time. I got in my car and rushed over. I made what was normally a 12-minute drive in five minutes flat. When I got there, I tried to slow my heart down. I carefully walked through the front door so as not to alarm the officers. My mission, simple. Get the police out, away from my family. I'm Ibram X. Kendi, and this is Be Anti-Racist. The intense fear I just described, it was about the hazards of racism, of course, but it was about something else as well. My brother has a learning disability. At the time he called the cops on our parents, 
He was in his mid-30s and struggling to find employment. It was a difficult time for him. When I entered the house, it was with the full understanding of the racist and ableist violence in this country when police are involved. I always fear for my brother's life around the police. In the United States, as many as half of the people who are killed by police are people with disabilities. And the fact that my brother had been struggling to find work, nothing unusual about it. The unemployment rate for people of color with disabilities is much higher than the national average and higher than that of white Americans with disabilities. As an historian, I know how deeply racism and ableism are intertwined in America. Starting in the 17th century, colonizers did not just call Native Americans racially inferior. They called them physically and mentally incapable of adapting to so-called civilization. And they went on to use this ableist framework to rationalize enslavement, force removal, and genocide. Well into the 19th century, slaveholders used racist, ableist ideas about Black people's supposed mental inferiority to justify slavery. In the 20th century, eugenicists deployed ideas of feeble-mindedness to forcibly sterilize Black, Latinx, and Indigenous women. Today, low-income and students of color are disproportionately assigned to special education classes, and young people of color with disabilities are more likely to face the gallows of incarceration. All of this was on my mind as I stepped into my parents' house. All of this kept me focused. Within minutes, the officers were walking out the door. I was closing it. I was turning to rest my back against it. I was exhaling, feeling as if our lives had been spared. I've never shared that story before. It has been unbelievably hard to share a memory that's so wrapped in anger over what my brother has experienced in his life. He never told me when he was being bullied at school. He never told me when he was being bullied at work. He didn't tell me until long afterwards because he knew what I would do. He protected me when I wanted to protect him. I carry so much shame for not doing more to fight for him and fight against this structural problem. My brother is in a better place now, but not in a place free of racism and ableism. I know how deeply the connection between racism and ableism still affects all of us. It's time to have more public conversations about what we can all do to change things. Today's show is for my older brother. I love you. Okay, so in Candy's podcast, which he it, I really encourage you to hear it uh, in full. Candy goes on to talk about how the history of racism and ableism interconnect, and how that carries in today's modern systems. He explains how these two interconnected systems affect his brother's life as a black disabled man, and. The podcast link will be posted in the accessible handout um, for this session. For the same podcast we just played, Professor Kendi had invited the disability activist, Rebecca Coakley. Rebecca talks about how she uses the working definition um, on this slide here. Um, from T.L. Lewis and her community. This is Rebecca's preferred definition of ableism. T.L. Lewis definition is, ableism is a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-Blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This systemic oppression 
leads to people and society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth, or living place, health and wellness, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. This definition is much more academic than the Lydia X. Z. Brown definition that we shared in our first introductory session. We acknowledge it is not as accessible because it uses specialized terms we don't always hear at our jobs or in our classrooms or at our dinner tables. But what we like about this definition is that it very explicitly states that ableism and racism share roots from the same tree in the United States, as Rebecca Coakley also said in Kendi's podcast. These roots are that ableism and racism have intersectional beginnings in US history that justified and justifies violence and subjugation against indigenous nations, Africans forced into slavery, and other groups as well as we see in modern uh, society. So we'd like you to please keep T.L. Lewis's definition at hand whenever you hear people talking about who is valuable and who is not valuable in society. Please think about this quote and return to it and share it with others along your learning journey. I think it's very powerful to keep this in mind. On this slide, there is a photo of Mia Mingus, who is a community organizer and writer. She identifies as a queer, physically disabled Korean, transracial, and transnational adoptee raised in the Carib Caribbean. She has on glasses and she has long black hair. The slide also shows her quote, which I adapted slightly. It says, ableism is connected to all our struggles because it undergirds notions and systems of whose bodies and minds are considered valuable, desirable, and disposable. In other words, ableism is unique as an oppressive system because it often is the justifier for other forms of systemic oppression like ra racism, sexism, homophobia. Next, we would like to share just a few slides of data uh, about how racism and, and ableism interconnect and intersect and how this affects disabled people of color more than others. Due to the short time for today, I did not show you a huge amount of data. However, I did place the extra data at the end of the slideshow, so you will be able to see it on the accessible handout on the website, because I think it's important information to have, but I just didn't have time to show you how pervasive this intersection of racism and ableism is. The one rate that I think everyone should know is that the poverty rates of working age people by race, ethnicity, and disability are important to know. This is from the 2018 census data. The red bars on the graph represent poverty rates for non-disabled people, and the blue bars represent poverty rates for disabled people. First, 
Over on the far right, the graph shows that disabled Americans live in poverty at more than twice the rate of non-disabled Americans. So that's on the right side. Now, from the left to the right of the graph, disabled non-Hispanic white Americans have poverty rates almost three times higher than disabled, non-disabled white Americans. So if you are white and you have a disability, you are three more times to live in poverty. The next bars, disabled non-Hispanic Black Americans have a poverty rate 4.5 times higher than non-disabled white Americans. The next bar, disabled Latinx Americans have a poverty rate 3.5 times higher than non-disabled whites, white people. And the last, disabled indigenous Americans have a poverty rate 3.5 times higher than non-disabled Americans. So clearly, the highest rates of poverty occur at the intersection of non-white races and disability status. It bears repeating the statistic that Ibram X. Kendi said earlier, 50% of people killed by police are disabled people. Charlena Lyles, shown here on the slide, was a young Black mother with a mental health disability. She is just one person of thousands of disabled people who have been killed by the police over history, historical times. This fact is vastly underreported by the media. The, the reason is police departments do not collect or share disability status and data, and nor are they mandated to. In a different study, Black Americans were shown to be 3.23 times more likely to be killed by police than white Americans. There is no intersectional data or comprehensive study yet about disabled Black people killed by police, but we can say that it is likely a higher rate than if just having a disability or just one's racial identity alone. For example, we should all know that Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, and George Floyd all had disabilities. Now let's transition to talk about how racial and disability justice can often get derailed or diluted with unhelpful detours away from our meaningful justice work. These missteps are called racial detours by Paul Gorski, which Muna, my co-facilitator, and I adapted for today to include disability detours. To honor that intersectional focus we are presenting um, to you all today. So my colleague Muna will now explain these equity detours to you to prep us for a short breakout session. Thank you, Rebecca. Muna Khalif speaking here. Now let's talk about racial and disability equity detours. Knowing these detours can help us avoid them so we can reach racial and disability justice sooner as a coalition. First, let's define them. Racial and disability detours are action and approaches that organizations often adapt in the name of equity. That might create the illusion of equity progress, but these do not actually cultivate more equity. Sometimes detours may be adopted based on misunderstanding about what equity means or misunderstanding on the level of transformation needed to achieve equity. Sometimes 
detours may be adapted purposefully to avoid more meaningful equity work. The purpose of naming detours is to give us language for unhelpful efforts so that we will be able to name them honestly and call them out when we see them. Next, next slide, please. Here are the first three detours Gorski defines. First, the pacing for privilege detour is when we pace racial and disability equity efforts to prioritize the comfort and interest of white and non-disabled people over efforts that would bring actual progress towards racial and disability equity. This means that organizations decide to move at the pace of the people with the least interest in racial and disability equity rather than the pace of the people who are most harmed and excluded from the system. Second, the deficit ideology detour is when we focus equity efforts on program initiatives or practice designed to adjust or quote unquote fix the values, cultures, behaviors of those people who are most harmed. This detour focuses the blame for inequities on disabled people or people of color, not being like the people that the system prefers more valuable and more normal. And instead, racial and disability equity should focus on, not on fixing disabled people and or people of color, but on removing the conditions in systems that marginalize them, especially wherever intersectional harm is happening. Third, the celebrating diversity detour is when organizations mistake student diversity groups or lessons about racial diversity for racial equity or anti-racist education as only a celebration of differences. Celebrating diversity, while important to do, does not make the larger system suddenly less inequitable. Racial equity change, oh, I'm sorry. We can go to the next uh, slide. Thank you. Four, the shiny new program detour is when we apply popular new programs to be equity work when they were never designed with equity in mind. Common programs today that are used this way includes trauma-informed practices, healing justice practices. This isn't to say that these aren't valuable programs to have, but it just means that sometimes the popular new approach was never built to identify or eliminate racism and ableism from our systems, which is what really equity effort should be doing. Five, the culture and special needs detour is when we avoid honestly addressing racism and ableism by focusing instead on vogue notions of culture and race or special needs and disability. These vague ideas are often called cultural competence, cultural proficiency, or disability awareness and disability acceptance. So racism and ableism are about power and oppression in systems. They are not just privileged people lacking cultural awareness or disability acceptance. Cultural competence and ADA compliance are important, but they do not prepare us to recognize or eliminate racism and ableism. Six, the individualizing racism and ableism detour is when we understand and respond to racism and ableism as only personal incidents or attitude or biases while ignoring institutional or structural 
racism, and ableism. If we only try to correct individuals' microaggression, for example, we will still have the racist and ableist systems intact. While understanding microaggression is important for us to know, it will not be enough to change the system. Lastly, it is important to remember that these detours can happen when we misunderstand what the problem is, how much work it is really going to take, or when we wish to look like we're doing equity work without actually changing the systems that are causing all these inequities and harm. Now we can shift to take some time to discuss systems that operate in racist and ableist ways. You might also spot detours happening in the examples. So feel free to call them out if you see them. Jenna, will you kindly help us, help everyone with the next um, breakout? Is that right? Are we taking a breakout yes. session? Yes, yep. sure. Thanks, Thank Muna. You. This is Jana speaking. Here are some tips about how to join a room for breakouts. When the breakout rooms are open, please click on the blue join button that should appear on your screen. Switch to group one for ASL interpretation or live captioning or go choose another room. But please, no more than five to six people per room. The grounding assumptions that we'll use, um, we will have eight minutes for the breakout. While Amanda gets us ready for that breakout, let's set a few of these grounding assumptions. Be present, however that works for you. Turn your camera on for breakouts if you can. Ensure everyone shares and holds space together. No one person should dominate the time. Speak from your own lived experience and ideas. Everyone is learning today. Each journey looks different. Address traveling statements by focusing on the words, not the speaker. Amanda, can you kindly paste the scenarios on the slide into the chat into three parts, A, B, and C? This activity is to practice thinking about how systems work instead of accepting common explanations that blame the person or group who is being harmed by these systems. The main question we'd like you to consider is, what is the systemic problem or problems? Your group can choose to start with A, B, or C. You don't need to do all three. Just do at least one and then more if there's time. The three scenarios are A, a college search committee concludes no qualified BIPOC applicant exists for the cultural diversity assistant director job. They hire the senior member's nephew, who is white and from Yale, since he did Peace Corps for a year. B, disabled and BIPOC college students finish degrees less than white non-disabled students. To fix this, the college assigns non-credit classes to improve these students' study skills in the first year. C, a university spent $20,000 to bring movie director Tyler Perry in to talk about restorative justice in barbershops for Black History Month. Bonus point, if you have time, which detour types do you spot above? Again, anyone wanting ASL interpretation or live captioning, please switch to breakout room one. The breakout time is short, again, only eight minutes, and we will give a broadcast notification when one minute remains. When you come back, one person should be ready to summarize your group's discussion in the chat. So choose a reporter before you come back to the main room. Amanda, we're ready for breakout rooms. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. We hope you had a good, albeit short discussion about the larger systemic issues in these examples. If you're the reporter for your group, please put in the chat a one sentence summary of what your group saw as the main systemic problem. Use the letter A, B, or C at the start of your sentence so we can connect 
them to the right scenario. If you did turn your camera on during the breakout, if you will please um, turn it off. If you haven't done so already, it helps us uh, keep our spotlights in the recording video um, more seamless. I'm sorry, give me one second. I'm, if someone is able to do it faster than I am, I'm having, okay. Why is this not working for me? It's okay. We can no, always put it on the handout. Not letting me paste. Jenna, is it letting you copy and paste? Mm. Why is it not letting me do this? I, Muna, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll put it in the handout. Thank you. Yeah. Please go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have um, one in chat, and I, I encourage you all to continue um, your reflections and summaries. They discussed the first situation quite a while. Nepotism should be addressed with systemic policies. No search committee members um, no, should have familial relationships among the applicants. And if there is an applicant with a familial relationship, the committee should the committee member should leave the committee. Um, yes, thank you very much. And there's continuing to be more coming in. So thank you all for your thoughtful reflections. Now we want to show an example of how racial and disability coalitions can work for justice. This is a picture of four disability leaders holding a press conference at an airport in 1977 as they head to DC. They were part of the 504 sit-ins that happened all over the US in 1977. And Amber and Tony were going a little off script here in the interest of time, so we apologize. But, um Patty Byrne and Stacey Milburn are leading disability justice advocates who are also women of color. While we don't have time to watch this video today, we encourage you to view it on your own. And this and all resources again will be included or will be accessible to you. On this slide, we show Lydia XZ Brown, Patty Byrne, Alice, Alice Wong, Moranike Giwu Onaiwu, Claudia Gordon, Leroy Moore, and Ha Ben Gurma. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. Rebecca, will you please cover the next slide? Yes, of course. So Patty Byrne and her coalition called Sins Invol Invalid um, created 10 concepts um, for disability justice, which is an intersectional framing. The principles are intersectionality, leadership of those most impacted, anti-capitalist politic, crossed movement solidarity, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross disability solidarity, interdependence, collective access and collective liberation. There is a link in the accessible handout that we will provide that will define these 10 concepts in more detail for you. But we wanted you to keep that for um, your learning. Next, we have a tool that is useful for when you are reflecting about where you feel you are on your racial and disability justice journeys. This original tool was developed for anti-racism racism alone by Andrew Ibrahim, but Muna and I talked and decided to add ableism to it as well, since again, we are talking about intersectionality today and the roots of these two isms are interconnected to the same tree, as Rebecca Coakley had said. 
So we want you to think about justice in this way and not silo um, one justice movement far away from the others because we can't be free unless we're all free. Um, to achieve this, there are three zones that you need to move through um, as a collective and as an individual. The first zone toward becoming anti-racist and anti-ableist is called the fear zone. And some people will never leave this fear zone, but it is when people live in denial or avoidance to stay comfortable. And they spend time only with people like themselves in terms of race and disability and other statuses. The second zone is called the learning zone. And in the learning zone, we recognize or know about the past and the present problems with ableism and racism. In this zone, we feel open enough to ask questions even when we feel uncomfortable. And we're okay with being vulnerable and honest about where we are. In the last zone, which is called the growth zone, this is where we recognize the many privileges that the system is giving us across our identities, but also knowing where the many harms occur for others or ourselves from these very same systems. This is the zone where we take action. Um, we will sit with our discomfort and we will not run away from tension. If we make mistakes in the growth zone, and everybody does, we learn from them and we don't give up, we don't retreat, we just get back to work. So it's important that we yield power, space, and time to people historically minoritized or silenced by the systems. Muna, can you take us through the last few slides? Yes, um, thank you. I was just chatting with our attendees. That is a powerful um, visual tool that you went over. So thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, Muna is speaking here. Here are some next steps you can take Learn from past and current leaders from multiple minoritized communities, such as those shared with you today. Never assume one person's experience, voice, and opinion counts for an entire community or group of people. Scrutinize systems, not victims, for racist and ableist disproportionalities. Spot it and name it if you face any racial and disability detours. Next slide, please. We have three more disability justice sessions coming up. Each one is one hour. On March 30th, we will talk about disability and how to think more inclusively about disability. On April 27th, we will hear from disabled activists and everybody disabled people, including Minnesota State students about allyship, advocacy, and disability pride. Lastly, on May 4th, we'll come together to take vision to action to co-create more inclusive classrooms, campuses, and Minnesota State community. All the sessions are from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Wednesday, so please join us. In this next slide, we listed many different resources here for you to keep you going on your learning journey. Again, these slides and links will be shared on the Equity 2030 website as an accessible handout. handout. A recording of this and all of our sessions will be shared on the same site you will be asked to fill out a very short survey link or a feedback survey. We hope you will fill that out and help us keep moving forward on our work. On behalf of Minnesota State and the Institute on Community Integration, thank you so much for coming today. We hope to see you on the next session on March 30th.